Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good middle of the night to wherever you are. And thank you for coming to this, my 22nd. And for now, the very last talk I'm giving like this because things are, are changing, um, but more about that later on. Okay. Yep, everything's okay. Um, today's talk, is on a uh, big societal issue addiction. And I've entitled it, When Pleasure Turns to Craving and Loss of Control. And my intention in this talk is to show you that addiction is uh, way more complex than most people think it is. Um, so let's see how we go with that. Um, oops. Um, so some housekeeping is that you're watching either through Facebook or Eventbrite. If you're watching on Facebook, then please um, like the, um, the event, um, put your comments and questions. So any questions you have at any point, just put them into the chat and I will be answering them at the end. So I won't answer them as we go along, we're accumulating them. And my wonderful team of helpers are harvesting the questions from Facebook chat and I'll be taking them at the end. If you're a tweety type person, then we'd love it if you tweeted about the talk and hashtagged us, etc. cetera. Um, so that would be great. And finally, uh, for some of you, this is your first talk. I know many of you, like uh, Superfan, Jane uh, Croucher, have been to more uh, previous talks. But for some of you, it's your, um, the first time you're coming to one of my talks. It's sad that it's the last one, but that's how it is. All of my previous 21 talks have been recorded, edited, and then uploaded onto my YouTube channel, um, which is Dr. Ashok Tansari Neuro Talk. You can find all the talks on there in a number of playlists for the four different series that we've had. And if you um, subscribe to this channel, free, you'll get a notification every time we put something else on. Now, the thing is that things are going to be changing in terms of my talk delivery. So to get any future content from me, you would need to be a subscriber to my channel, but more about that later on. So that's our housekeeping. Um, the final time I'll, I'll be saying welcome like this, because I do this for the live talks, is to welcome you all from the different parts of the world. Um, I know that there's a new lab in at, uh, the university in Bangkok that Graham Pluck is heading, and so that's welcome, or Swadi Kai, I hope, in Thai at the top, but also to all of the other languages and people around the world that have tuned in. So thank you very much for tuning in and coming to see us. So I'm just checking whether um, everything's okay. Yes, everything's okay. So I think we're good to go. So welcome. Um, now, first of all, I need to thank the people who are doing all of this. And these are the people that I'm partly in touch with at the moment via WhatsApp to make sure that you can hear me, see me, etc. So um, these people have helped me at, at various stages. So I want to thank each and every one of them. Uh, Oscar, Claudia, Dominic, Francesco, Lindsay, Lofty, Anisha, Andrea, Kim, Pedro, uh, Priyanka, Denise, Elika, Vitote, Disha, and Veronica. Thank you all for the help that you've given me over the last year to deliver these talks. And it's been a pleasure to work with you all and thank you all for your help. And for this particular talk, I want to single out the young lady in the top right hand corner, Lindsay Hall, who is one of my students and she's helped me put this talk together. So thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Lindsay's mom. I would also like to extend my thanks to these two organizations, AA and We Are With You because both of these organizations have helped me to different degrees for this talk by providing me um, first-hand accounts from people that they're working with, uh, people who, who are um, dealing with uh, drug, alcohol, abuse, et cetera. Um, and uh, so for me, it's really important that I try to represent the people that this talk is about. So thank you to those organizations that are doing great work to help these people recover. 
As an overview, what I'm going to do is start off with uh, stereotypical attitudes about addiction and then move into what it's all about, which is pleasure, um, because that's the starting point for addiction and how addiction becomes the loss of control over these pleasurable activities. And as a neuropsychologist, I'm going to then tell you a tiny bit about what's happening at the biological level and then at the psychological level. I'll talk about rehab. I'm not going to talk much about rehab just because uh, I'm not a rehab person, but just to say that rehab, uh, people in rehab are trying to help with this. Um, I was going to talk about individual differences in addiction to do with personality and genetics, but I'm, I'm not going to have time, um, but I will answer questions if there are any. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what society needs to do um, for helping people with addiction. So off we go. So to those of us who don't know much about addiction, and I would say that I don't know that much, I know more than the lay person, there are stereotypical images. Most people who know nothing about addiction have, have very clear ideas. So this is this would be a, a classic image of someone who's down and out, shooting up, etc. And the film Train Spotting kind of gives us an image of addiction. But that's a really skewed image. And although that's one image of addiction, it's not necessarily everything and it also labels people in terms of just a, a, a very simplistic view and uh, I'll give you an a personal anecdote that I was at dinner with someone who shall remain nameless uh, the day that Whitney Houston died and we were talking about this and this woman said well it's ridiculous and I said well you know she was she was an unhappy person she was battling with you know difficulties etc and I don't know why how etc but it seemed like she was in pain and she was taking painkillers or whatever but whatever it is we don't know she had difficulties and and all this woman said was well I've had difficulties in my life and I didn't turn into an addict and I thought oh yes it's all about you isn't it because it's as simple as that that an addict is just this other category of person. They're weak, they're this, that, and the other. There's absolutely no understanding of what might have taken them there and how, you know, for the grace of God, it could be any of us. And I think what I want to try to do, and I, uh, I, don't, uh, I hope I can do some of this, is to demonstrate that it could have happened to anyone and there are lots of issues that many of us would never think of. So that's one image of addiction. Um, would you think of this as addiction? Well, we've got these two parents who are uh, on their phones, they're kind of ignoring their kid. We know that there's so much societal addiction to um, uh, uh, online presence. There's a huge problem at the moment, especially in East Asia, in places like Korea, uh, with uh, gaming addiction, uh, to the point where uh, South Korea has declared war on gaming addiction because it's blighting their youth. They even have rehab centers for people who are addicted to online presence. There are research studies about people who, can't, who have to live their lives through social media. Now, that image is a bit far from the poor young man in the top picture, but it's still an addiction. What about this? This middle-class woman with all her shopping bags if, if someone is shopping all the time in, um, in a manner that is, effect is not really sustainable, that's an addiction. So I think we should be careful about how we view addiction. It's very easy to pick on a particular image because it fits into our view of addiction. But many of us have got um, things that we really like. We might really like alcohol. We might like going to parties. We might like going to on holidays, etc. And one of the things here is, when is it pleasurable? When is it um, an addiction? And the fact that it could happen to anyone really. So um, an important thing in addiction or in any psychological behavior is an issue which is known as comorbidity. And comorbidity is the fact that often you have 
conditions or behaviors that go with one another. Now, as an example, most people have heard of um, ADHD, the Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and um, dyslexia. Now, those two might sound like separate things, but they're quite comorbid. So if you have ADHD, there's a decent chance that you're going to be dyslexic as well. So comorbidity is the fact that these things don't exist as separate entities. There are commonalities between them. And this happens with addictions as well. So in this review, this group of people looked at lifetime estimates of substance use disorders in behavioral addictions. So what we've got um, on the, in the um, table on the left-hand side is behavioral addiction. So ones that you wouldn't necessarily think of as addiction, but pathological gambling, kleptomania. There was a, an amazing um, case at the Victorian Albert Museum in London that I commented on in um, BBC's One Show, where there was a man who for 20 years had been, who worked in the warehouses there, and had been stealing works of art from the Victorian Albert. And that's kleptomania, it's a disorder. Pathological skin picking, compulsive sexual behavior, internet addiction, compulsive buying. So those are all behavioral. They don't involve substances. And yet the lifetime estimates of a substance use disorder for someone who's got one of those is pretty decent as well. So any of these addictions do not exist on their own. They tend to have comorbidities. And what that suggests is that this thing called addiction is not just a biological thing. There must be something underlying them, that it's not just about the substance, whether it's heroin or uh, ecstasy or whatever. It's that there's something that's happened that's below that at a biological level, which isn't just to do with the, the drug. I want to start with some personal stories just to put the context of, of what um, I mean about some of these things. And these are the stories that were given to me by um, We're With You Charity. And these are for some of their clients. So I'm just gonna read them out. Um, this the first person said, I began my drinking career as a teenager, underage drinking and going to the pub and partying as, many, as did many of my contemporaries. I come from a family that has a history of alcohol problems and where heavy drinking was often normalized. In my 20s, I took up employment where heavy drinking was deeply embedded within the culture, a play hard, work hard environment. Many people, including me, married, had relationships within the work environment. Most of us did not come from, uh, come from the place our work was located and the provision of alcohol-based social activity facilities meant we practically only ever mixed with each other. This carried on for many years, heavy, though not totally dependent drinking. I and many other heavy drink, drinking colleagues held down responsible and demanding jobs. So here you've got a, a story of someone who had alcohol in the background, but because of work, there was a, a lot of drinking, heavy, but not dependent. And that's an important thing there. And people who had responsible jobs. But when I was 49, my wife died suddenly, unexpectedly and traumatically. As you can imagine, this tipped me over into alcohol dependency, mostly to mask the trauma of what happened and the crippling anxiety that I developed. I eventually, eventually took early retirement from my job and underwent treatment for my alcohol addiction. I haven't drunk alcohol for over eight years. Now, importantly, there is tipped me over into alcohol dependency, air dependency and to mask the trauma of what happened. So the alcohol is actually, it's almost uh, the outcome of what's happened. Whereas a lot of people would label the alcohol, taking the alcohol as the issue itself. This next one, my husband was in the military where drinking is almost encouraged, then went into sales, where again, the culture was to encourage meetings and social environments, usually alcohol fueled coupled with high pressures, causing stress and exacerbating his complex PTSD, which he'd got from the army. This caused the, the alcohol to be used not only as a work tool, but as self-medication to forget stress and mental health issues. And here we've got 
that thing that um, alcohol or drugs can be part of these high pressure environments. And people know about city traders who are using lots of coke to keep going, for example. Now, then this lady said that this materialized later in life as he had steered clear of alcohol in his younger life, as he'd grown up in a family with alcohol issues and felt com uncomfortable with it. So in this case, unlike the previous case, this man had actually got alcohol in his background uh, as a young person and had tried to stay away from it. But then in the military and then in his sales job, it was really encouraged and it was part of the life and this tipped him over. And finally, um, the third story was, for me and others, it's been a means to cope with not coping with, feel with feelings, emotions that have not had space and safety to be explored. What helped me stop my drinking was to work on the trauma whilst getting practical support and peer support around my drinking along with social activity that made me feel less isolated. Seeing mental health and alcohol alcohol use as two separate things that have been very, very unhelpful to me in the past. And even dual diagnosis does not capture it. It's all a part of the trauma and trying to cope with it. I want to scream, stop diagnosing me, look what's behind the diagnosis. There are only the bits you, you see like the tip of an iceberg. So the important thing here is again, that um, the alcohol is a coping strategy for things that are underlying. And so seeing them as separate is actually missing the point completely, that you need to look at the, the reasons that someone turned to the alcohol to try to help them. And then finally, this person said, in Gabriel Mate's book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, one of the people he supported gave the best description of addiction I've heard. I take the drugs so I don't feel the feeling I feel when I don't take the drugs. And that really amazingly encapsulates effectively what the biological thing behind addiction is, that it's to take away the feeling when the drug or the behavior pattern isn't there. It's actually to cope with the feeling that's been created as a result of the addiction. And it's very complicated, but it's very important to note that it is a coping strategy. So I'm going to try to explore some of this at a biological and psychological level. So it is a pleasure. And by that, what I mean is that everything to do with addiction starts off with things that are pleasurable to begin with. They're not, someone doesn't start these activities because they want to have a difficult life. It is because of the pleasure. Now, a, a way to look at this has been to try to understand what is it um, in animals that makes them do uh, things that are pleasurable, for example? Now, in a really classic study from the 1950s, two scientists called Olds and Milner, they were trying to work out what is the reward center of the brain? What is the area of the brain that seems to really get, get animals going and want to do something? Now, having trained rats to press a lever in a little uh, experimental cage, which would give it some food, they had trained this rat to know that they needed to press this lever to get something. Now, what they then did is that they put surgical electrodes in different parts of the rat's brain, and the electrode was left there. And what they did was to set it up such that the, the rat got a little electri electrical stimulation every time it pressed this lever. So if it pressed the lever, it got a bit of a zzz. And it pressed the lever again, it got a bit of a zzz. Now what they did is that they looked at the rat's behavior when they moved that electrode around to different areas of the rat's brain. And at one point, what they found was that that rat went crazy. The rat was pressing the lever like there wasn't a tomorrow. The rat became completely disinterested in, in the food and the water that was in the cage. All the rat wanted to do was to press that lever. So effectively, that zzz that it was getting, it was enjoying it so much that it wanted it more and more and more and more to the exclusion of food and, and, and water. 
So what Olds and Milner uh, decided was that they had found the reward center of the brain, that now that that was being stimulated, the rat was so happy that the rat didn't need anything else. And that area is deep inside the brain. And that brings me to the fact that we're effectively glorified rats. Um, we have three brains going on in one. Um, this three brain um, idea is basically an evolutionary way to explain where we've come to. The oldest part of the brain is known as the reptilian brain, and it's the one in yellow here, and it's the one for in instincts and urges. So it's the one that allows us to see uh, uh, danger, react to things, etc. So that's the old part of the brain. And that's the reptilian brain, and it's not very evolved. Then the second brain is a red area, which is sometimes known as the mammalian brain. And this is where emotion and motivation come in. And this is uh, the, known as the limbic brain as well, because that's where emotions are. And animals have this. So you can see animals are happy, angry, et cetera, et cetera, the way they care for their young. So that's emanating from that middle brain, the emotional centers. Then finally, the walnutty bit on the outside is known as the neocortex or the new cortex. And that's the decision-making or cognitive brain. So we've got these three areas, the reptilian brain, which is instinctual. We've got the, the limbic or emotional brain, um, which is giving us feeling and emotion. And then finally, we've got the cognitive or thinking brain on the outside. Now, it's not to say that, that uh, we're the only species that has the neocortex. It's that ours is the most developed of, of all the animals. So how is this important? Well, it's important because it's all about control. Now, here we have um, the, a cross-section of the brain. Now, the reward center, that area that they were zzzing in um, the Mul uh, Milner study, is this area called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, which is deep inside the brain, um, but it's a very important part of the brain because that's where reward comes in. Now, that is the area that responds to pleasurable activities, drink, sex, food, and those are biological things that have been programmed into us that we share with other animals that also respond to drink, food, and sex. So those are areas that um, stimulate that reward center and make us and other animals want more of it. Now, that area of the brain is what was stimulated by Olds and Milner when they found the reward centers. Now, very importantly, that area is also the area that can be stimulated by drugs such as opiates, cocaine, cannabis, nicotine, etc. Now, the reason for this is simply the fact that those drugs they share biological properties with our nervous system. Uh, um, I can't go into that uh, in this talk because it's quite complex, but suffice to say that these drugs are effectively just dealing, uh, working on the receptors in our nervous system that allow us to enjoy drink, sex, food, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that they're, they're alien uh, uh, invaders, they're working on um, a system that's already hardwired and they just seem to happen to resemble it. That's why we enjoy them. Now, importantly, that reward area, the VTA, that is linked to another area called the nucleus accumbens, which very importantly is linked to the front of the brain. Now, the reason that this is important is that we've got a link between the second brain, where we're getting that wow, I really like that feeling. And the front of the brain, which is the most advanced part of the brain, which helps us control behavior. And basically what addiction is about is a, a break in that circuit or a weakening of that circuit. So for example, um, I had my research team meeting yesterday and after my research team meeting, we stay on on the call and we just chat and sometimes some uh, alcohol, wine or beer may come out. And um, because we actually like one another, we continue chatting. And the team meeting is two hours long. 
we did have one team meeting that went on for nine hours because we were enjoying chatting to each other so much. Um, we've created a nice community, which is quite nice. And in that, I managed to drink a bottle and a half of red wine. It was nice wine, so don't worry. Now, I didn't do that last night because I had the talk today. And when my team were telling me to stay on, I said, no, I've got, I've got to give two talks. I actually had to give a talk earlier today. And I said, no, I need to go because I've got work to do for these two talks tomorrow. And if I stay on, I'll, I'll not be able to function tomorrow. Now, what was happening there is that the, the reward centers, they were saying, oh, this is really nice. I'm enjoying the wine and I'm enjoying the company of, of my team. I want to stay. But the front of the brain said, hang on, you've got to give two talks tomorrow. Uh, I don't think you should be staying on. And the front of the brain was the one that won over and told me to go to bed. So that's what happens under normal circumstances. We evaluate and we know whether to have more or not. And what's happened in, um, in addiction is a loss of that control over time. It doesn't happen overnight. So a definition from the NHS website is that addiction is defined as not having control over doing, taking, or using something to the point where it could be harmful to you. Now, important in that is where it could be harmful to you. So it's not the doing, taking, or using something, because those are pleasurable activities that that, uh, that uh, happen to stimulate that uh, um, reward area. It's where it could be harmful to you, where it becomes problematic. And I'm going to come back to that right at the end. So what's happening at the biological level to explain this? Right, so this is a photograph of me throwing myself out of a plane at 14,000 feet um, over the Blue Mountains uh, outside Sydney a number of years ago. I mean, what's this got to do with the price of bread? Well, the reason that I'm showing you this is because the theories that helped us start understanding some aspects of of the biology of addiction actually started with um, skydiving. So why is it that people do this ridiculous thing of throwing themselves out of planes and then do it again and again and again and again? And what they were looking at was something called the opponent process theory, or they developed this thing called opponent process theory, which effectively is about the fact that in any system, um, what goes up must come down. So in, um, in the case of the skydiving, there's fear to begin with, but that fear was taken over by that, oh my God feeling that I had after the first second and a half when I was just hurtling towards Earth at um, 10 meters per second squared. And then the parachute thing opened and then I was floating down to Earth and it was amazing. Now, the, um, if we take an example of something that is uh, uh, pleasurable rather than scary, say alcohol, we have the, the gray horizontal line is our general mood and um, the gray flat line is normal circumstances when you haven't had a substance or you haven't thrown out yourself out for plane. Now, for a pleasurable activity, initially you have that feel-good thing. Oh, this tastes nice. Oh, that feels good, et cetera, et cetera. And that is uh, the reason we take it, because it feels good. But eventually, when the, uh, that wine is gone or whatever, the system biologically is designed to come back down to normality. And that's the way our biological systems are, have been de developed to bring us back to that equilibrium, the gray line. And to do that, it basically overshoots and goes down into a bit of a negative period. How that happens, we don't need to worry about. But everyone knows that feeling of the post-holiday blues. We've been on holiday, which is the up bit, the A. After the holiday, we come back and we feel a bit blue for a bit. Or we have a nice weekend and then on Monday we feel a bit blue, which is the negative bit. And then it equalizes and it goes back to the gray over time. And that's known as the opponent process theory, that initially there's one feeling and then our system has, has evolved such that it goes to a negative or the opposite 
and then it comes back to normality. So taking the example of a drug in the top line, so uh, the way to read this is like a timeline going from the left to the right. So you take um, a drug and the initial process in red below it is the nice feeling. Then you also have the negative feeling, which is the B process, which comes a bit later on. And the system is, is developed such that eventually it equalizes and you stay on your, on your horizontal line, the black dotted lines. And that's how things work under normal circumstances. But what the, um, has happened or uh, what happens to the system is that over time, the system adapts, it gets too used to things and eventually, and it's not well understood, but eventually taking the drug, taking the alcohol, et cetera, gives you very little of the good feeling, the bit above the dotted line. So you, you see at the bottom, uh, bottom right there, you've only got a tiny little high, but you've got a big low after that. And that is when addiction is set in because you've done it over and over again, and you're mainly only getting the opponent process. So what um, uh, the biological explanation of this is, is that, that that gray line, the flat line, is what's known as homeostasis, which is the way that our biological system has developed to generally keep us on the level. But if you overdo something, what happens is that your normal starts shifting lower and lower and it reaches a different level, which is way lower. And eventually you're not getting any pleasure out of the activity. All you're doing is to take your substance to take away the negative feeling. And this, this goes back to one of the, the quotes that I told you about at the beginning, where the person said that they were just taking the alcohol to take away the feeling that they had. The alcohol, uh, the alcohol was no longer giving them any pleasure. The alcohol was really just to take away that feeling in the gray zone where things have gone really bad. And so addiction is really the point at which you're not doing it for pleasure. You've lost control and you're just trying to cope with the negative feeling. At the psychological level, the suggestion is that there's this um, kind of complex spiral that happens that after you've got to that point where you're mainly taking it just to mask uh, the negative feelings, you develop a binge intoxication where you, you start taking a lot of this substance um, in amounts that are larger than you intended to. And what that then results in is the withdrawal and those negative feelings, that gray zone where you're only feeling pretty negative and not, not great, but then you have this persistent desire and slowly because of social, occupational or recreational activities, you end up taking more and more of this until you become preoccupied about the substance, whether it's the drug or the alcohol or the shopping, or uh, your next gaming session, et cetera. So all you're doing is preoccupied. You're thinking about that substance or that activity, and all you can do is anticipate the next time you can have it. And this is when addiction is set in, because at that point, you're not really drinking or taking the drug or whatever for any of the positive consequences. You've effectively lost control. You're preoccupied, and the only thing you can think about is the drug or the activity. So it's, a, it's a, an, an, an insidious process. It spirals, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And it happens because of other things that are happening around the person. And um, in uh, a couple of the stories we heard about the work pressures and, and the military and the, the social, occupational and recreational activities. So you eventually get to that point where, where you lose control because of the things around you. So what are the long-term impacts of this? Now, Nora Volko, who's a really good researcher in this area in the States, she used PET scanning to examine um, dopamine release. Now, dopamine is um, 
uh, a feel-good hormone. I won't go into the details, but it's an important hormone for our feeling good. And she looked at this in cocaine-addicted individuals. Now, what she did was she showed them videos and the videos could be of really just nice nature scenes like this. Um, so there's a video of uh, a stream running through this, this valley. Or she sh and she also showed videos of someone um, snorting cocaine. And she was looking at their brains while they were watching these videos to see what was happening in terms of dopamine release in these cocaine addicted individuals. And what she found is that the amount of dopamine released in the brains of these cocaine addicts was the same whether they watched this pleasurable um, video of nature or someone um, snorting cocaine. So it seemed that there's something happening in, at a long term level where even watching someone snorting cocaine was giving these people pleasure and that would fuel that anticipation and preoccupation. And so this is where environmental triggers, seeing someone do something, hearing someone talk about it, seeing it on TV, reading about it can trigger off the desire to do this. And because it's becoming a biological thing that is happening without that much control. Now, I've done some work in this area with an assessment that I've created called Jeff, the Jansari Assessment of Executive Functions. And I'm happy to answer questions for anyone who's particularly interested in this area. But basically we created a task, which was actually for um, uh, helping understand the impact of brain damage on people with acquired brain injuries. But uh, because I was working with people who were in rehabilitation, we created this task which involved them um, pretending that they're going to work in an office for an afternoon to set up a meeting. I won't go into the details. We created the task to look at a number of things that we know that the front of the brain, that control area, is um, involved in. And it's involved in allowing us to plan. It's, allow it's involved in allowing us to prioritize putting one thing before another because we know that one thing is important. It allows us to think creatively, adaptively. It also allows what's known as prospective memory, which is memory for something in the future, such as remember to turn the oven on for dinner later on, etc. So that's memory for something in the future. Now, we created this task for, for dealing with people with brain damage, but then we started using it also for looking at um, situations where it's known that these executive functions, which are damage and brain damage, are also compromised because of uh, drug taking. And um, th this is a, a shot from our study because the, the, the um, experiment is actually a computer game. So uh, someone is moving around this computer game, doing things and we're scoring their behavior. If anyone's interested in this, we're recruiting participants for this study, or, or not for cocaine, but for lots of other things. So do get in touch with us if you're interested. So um, we did a study with people who are taking cannabis to look at their um, cognitive functioning. And what we found, the main thing here is that our cannabis users performed much more, po much, uh, more poorly compared to non-users on this task of executive functions, which is how the front of the brain is um, uh, controlling behavior. So what we see in my task is that when you look at the ability of people who've been taking a substance such as cannabis for a long time, their ability to use these control functions that we need in an everyday situation are compromised. And so what we have here is a behavioral um, consequence that we can pick up in my type of, uh, in my particular paradigm. And we've used it also to look at the effects of ecstasy and alcohol, uh, nicotine, caffeine, etc. Okay, the next thing is the fragility of the adolescent brain. Now, the reason for this is that um, our brains are developing from child from birth, and um, what's happening in the brain is that it's developing at different rates in different parts. 
Now, the back part of the brain develops relatively quickly and is probably fully formed by the age of about five years of age. But the front of the brain, which is the control center, is not fully functional until the mid 20s. And that's quite scary because the middle part of the brain, which is that, ooh, that feels really nice, that reward center, is fully functional at puberty. So a young person, 12, 13, et cetera, will get that, oh, wow, that was nice feeling from taking some alcohol or whatever. But their ability to say, I don't think I should have some more, isn't fully functional until another 10 years or so. Now, that's why that area of adolescence is a particularly problematic point for addictions to set in. And that's why it's so important that children are taught about the consequences of, of drug taking, etc. because unfortunately, we know that when that system is still developing, the reward center is completely ready, but the ability to say yes or no or control behavior isn't ready. That's when you can impair the system and that impairment can be irreversible. Now in a study in, um, in New Zealand called the Dunedin study, and it's a longitudinal study in which they've been um, tracking a cohort of people for 30 or 40 years and looking at all sorts of health variables, et cetera. They looked at neuropsychological decline on IQ tests from childhood into middle life. And what they did is that they, they because they'd been testing these people um, uh, periodically, they had their scores from different points in life. And they were able to look at people who took, took up cannabis use um, before the age of 18, and those people who took up cannabis use after the age of 18. And they compared their scores today as adults to their scores um, when they were kids. And the big finding was that the ones in black who'd taken up cannabis before the age of 18, they showed a bigger drop in IQ than the ones who took it up uh, in adulthood. And so what you see here is that um, adolescents who'd taken up the, the, the cannabis earlier in life, or people who took up uh, cannabis as adolescents, they ended up with a bigger drop in IQ and cognitive functioning than people who took up the same substance later on in life. And what they found, and it's not in this graph, what they found is that if people stopped taking cannabis, there was a different impact depending on whether they took it up as children or as adults. If they took it up as adults and then stopped it, then there was a reversible effect. But if they'd taken it up as children, then the effect and the problem was irreversible and it was long-term. So this is why it's really important that we're careful about what children are taking. The next thing to talk about is the fact that your environment, where you are, makes a big difference. And this is why social issues come into it, because it's not just about the biology, it's about your social issues. And in this um, remarkable study, um, where some researchers created what they called a rat park, where they brought, brought up this little guy and um, his relatives, and they brought them up in different conditions. So this guy could have been brought up in isolation. Um, so he was just on his own and he had access to uh, a drink which had opioids in it and access to something else as well. And what they found is that social isolation results in this thing that they call isolation syndrome and increased opioid consumption. But if they, if they let some of his relatives and friends in um, to share that sterile environment, the interaction with drug naive animals, so his relatives uh, and friends, uh, they, they hadn't had any opioids. When they came in, he started reducing his opioid abuse. So just that socialization with friends, relatives, et cetera, who weren't taking um, who hadn't been taking any opioids, 
produce them. Or if they put him in an enriched environment with some wheels and things to play with, things to look at, etc., cetera, his, um, his addiction decreased even more. So what we see here is that the same rat in different circumstances is going to end up relying on this opioid um, to different levels. When he's isolated, he might end up taking it more. When there are, when he's got social companionship um, with others who don't, who haven't been taking the drugs, he reduces his drug taking. If you put him in a nice environment, again, we see a decrease there. So we see that the environment that he's in is really important to um, to the trajectory of what happens to him. And what that suggests is that if we change the environments that people are in, we might actually be helping them to reduce their reliance on these drugs. And that's where social policy comes in and how you treat people like this. So in terms of treatment, <coughs> excuse me, there are lots of treatment packages and I'm not, I'm not going to go into them because each of them has got a different philosophy and different methods, etc. And some of them do work. So this is um, some data that uh, Lindsay found, which showed that um, in a particular uh, survey or research study, they found that 47% of people completed a particular treatment program. But um, half people, they exited the treatment program, so they didn't complete it. Some people dropped out, <coughs> some people transferred, um, etc. And what they found is that about 60% of people who completed the treatment <coughs> were only there for alcohol dependency. Um, but 24%, only 24% were opiate users who completed the treatment, which means that 76% of people who were opiate users did not complete the treatment. <coughs> so in this case, rehab wasn't working. So what that suggests is that the treatment programs might not be finding the issue that is causing the addiction. Now, <coughs> in another study in the States, that was done with war veterans, because in the States, there's a, a big veterans um, administration to look after um, people who have served in the armed forces. They looked at long-term outcomes after residential substance use treatment. And what they found, unfortunately, is that over time, the proportion of people who completed treatment, who stayed sober, was decreasing. <coughs> and the ones who failed to complete treatment was actually quite high. So ultimately, what they're finding in the States also is that while some people do complete treatment, a lot of people actually fail to um, complete treatment and they relapse as well. And that's quite a, a hard thing to accept that these treatment programs for war veterans, et cetera, are, just, are not working as well as they should. So society needs to look at these issues and there are complex reasons behind this and it's difficult to, to know what to do. But I want to try to end on a more positive note, which is that, that some countries have a more an enlightened approach. And I think this is because of the way that they're just looking at the issue of addiction. Now, Portugal decided to decriminalize drugs um, uh, a while ago, and there were three pillars to their decriminalization policy. The first was that there's no such thing as a soft or hard drug, only healthy and unhealthy relationships with drugs. And that's rather important because societally, we talk about uh, heroin or uh, uh, meths or LSD as, as uh, hard drugs. But in fact, in terms of the number of deaths that are caused, alcohol and nicotine actually cause more um, deaths than those drugs. But societally, we've given um, those other drugs 
this label of hard drugs, whereas we're okay with alcohol and nicotine. But in Portugal, they decided it wasn't, don't blame the drug, it's the relationship with the drug that's the issue. Another one was that an individual's unhealthy relationship with drugs often conceals frayed relationships with loved ones, with the world around them and with themselves. So again, this echoes some of the things that were said um, by the um, stories that I gave you earlier, where people talked about the trauma that they'd experienced. So the drugs are concealing those traumas. And then finally, and I think this is very enlightened, that the eradication of all drugs is an impossible goal. And I think just accepting that, that the drugs are there, trying to say that we're not going to have any drugs is pie in the sky thinking. You accept that they're there and you find ways to make it um, uh, societally okay, not saying just take them, but but to, to destigmatize them, et cetera. And maybe these people will end up seeking help more often. Um, and th this attitude has had quite important results. So this is a graph of drug-related deaths um, and drug-induced deaths in Portugal. Now, the drug-related deaths, they, they're there because if people have been taking drugs, then their health, um, their health uh, has been compromised. So you expect those to be there anyway. But what they've seen since um, 2000, when uh, I can't remember when this was decriminalized, is that there's a decrease in drug-induced deaths. So people aren't dying while they're taking these drugs because they're in unsafe environments, they're taking the drug too much, et cetera. When it's out in the open, it's not criminalized, they're taking the drugs in safer environments, maybe not taking them as much, et cetera. And the result is a reduction in, in deaths. <clears throat> there are other statistics as well that <clears throat> were not as easy to demonstrate, but there's been redu a reduction in crime, um, reduction in HIV infections, etc., all to do with people using drugs, but a tiny bit more responsibly. So I think that there are ways that society can tackle this without turning it into a big taboo. Then finally, <clears throat> my good news story. <coughs> this is a story that a homeless drug addict who's become a professor. So this is um, Jesse Thistle, um, who was homeless, suffering a bad infection, and had been addicted to meths and cocaine, and he saw prison as a safe haven. And now he's working as an assistant professor at York University in Toronto, and has really turned his life around. So just because someone is an addict at the, today, it doesn't mean that there's only one, one way for them to go. It's about the way that they're treated, the way that they're supported, the hope that they're given, and then hopefully for them to find their way back. But to consign people to a particular um, semantic category, I think is, is effectively condemning them. And, and I think that that's ridiculous. So I think that this is a wonderful story to, to end on, that, that there is hope and people can turn their lives around and um, have these wonderful outcomes. So to summarize, addiction is complex and at, the, at its root is a loss of control. There are new neurobiological mechanisms that result in an activity or substance that used to provide pleasure eventually becoming an object of craving. There are multiple reasons that this can occur, including life experiences, uh, deaths, traumas, etc., the environment, social as well as physical, personality and genetics. There are probably many different subpopulations, which is possibly why you have the relapse rates out of different treatment programs, which are done as a catch-all. Treatment programs exist and have some success. However, the large relapse rates from programs may be linked to our limited understanding of addiction. These people who are going into the programs want to, want to um, uh, stop uh, the addiction but if we're not tackling the root cause of the addiction, then when they go back out again, then, then you're exposing them to a risk of relapse anyway. 
Nonetheless, it is possible to create policies and structures to help individuals towards more successful lives. So that's it. Um, if you want to take part in our research, which is on many different things, um, please do get in touch with us to this email, r.gold.mind at gmail.com. Um, tell us your name, age, your gender. If you've got any neurological conditions such as epilepsy or cognitive difficulties such as dyslexia or anything like that, or if you've got a strength and you're exceptional at something like face memory or anything like that, then do tell us about it. We work in in three uh, quite broad areas, memory, face recognition, and how the front of the brain manages behavior. We work with kids, adolescents, adults, people with brain injury, as well as people without brain injury. So basically we take everyone. So do come and let us know. We've got a very big project on dementia um, and we need people from the ages of 18 upwards to take part in our, our study. We're, we're trying to, profile um, memory in just the regular population, because once we can profile that, that will give us an insight into, into what is dementia. We need to know what the average person experiences before we can understand dementia. These are our social media um, accounts for my team. And you can find out more um, by visiting our website, which is gull.ac.uk forward slash art lab. And if your organization, school, whatever, would like me to come and give a talk on any of the subjects that I've spoken on, then please contact me um, directly. Okay, so finally, I want to thank you all, especially those of you who held my hand ooh, a year ago when I gave that first talk on Zoom and it was all a bit weird and then all the things that happened after that, trying to go into Facebook, the problem of going live on Facebook, the technical difficulties, the event bright issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so thank you for your support. Um, as I said, this is the last talk of this kind because it's been quite um, shattering to give these talks, and I've decided that um, it's not really feasible for me to continue like this. We are changing what we're going to do. We're creating a new model, which will be um, through YouTube. And um, we're also moving on to a couple of other platforms. And therefore, if you want to know more about our talks, you will need to keep in touch with us. And so therefore, for that, um, we need you to fill in a feedback survey. And my team will now be um, at the, um, the putting a link to that survey onto Facebook, could you please do that survey now? Because I'm going to have a three minute break and the survey will only take you a couple of minutes to do. And then I'm going to come back and answer some questions um, that have already been sent in. And if you don't mind, I'm going to have a glass of wine, but I'm going to control my intake. And I'll leave you with a photograph of my lovely mummy on her 80th birthday. Um, and it's always a delight seeing her face. So I'll see you in a few minutes.